by Jules Verne, Part One, Chapter Six. The inventory of the articles possessed by these castaways from the clouds, thrown upon a coast which appeared to be uninhabited, was soon made out. They had nothing save the clothes which they were wearing at the time of the catastrophe. We must mention, however, a notebook and a watch which Gideon Spilett had kept, doubtless by inadvertence, not a weapon, not a tool, not even a pocket-knife, for while in the car they had thrown out everything to lighten the balloon. The imaginary heroes of Daniel Defoe or of Wyss, as well as Selkirk and Raynal, shipwrecked on Juan Fernandez and on the archipelago of the Aucklands, were never in such absolute destitution. Either they had abundant resources from their stranded vessels, in grain, cattle, tools, ammunition, or else some things were thrown up on the coast, which supplied them with all the first necessities of life. But here, not any instrument whatever, not a utensil. From nothing they must supply themselves with everything. And yet, if Cyrus Harding had been with them, if the engineer could have brought his practical science, his inventive mind to bear on their situation, perhaps all hope would not have been lost. Alas! they must hope no longer again to see Cyrus Harding. The castaways could expect nothing but from themselves and from that providence which never abandons those whose faith is sincere. But ought they to establish themselves on this part of the coast, without trying to know to what continent it belonged, if it was inhabited, or if they were on the shore of a desert island? It was an important question, and should be solved with the shortest possible delay. From its answer they would know what measures to take. However, according to Pencroft's advice, it appeared best to wait a few days before commencing an exploration. They must, in fact, prepare some provisions, and procure more strengthening food than eggs and mollusks. The explorers, before undertaking new fatigues, must first of all recruit their strength. The chimneys offered a retreat sufficient for the present. The fire was lighted, and it was easy to preserve some embers. There were plenty of shellfish and eggs among the rocks and on the beach. It would be easy to kill a few of the pigeons which were flying by hundreds about the summit of the plateau, either with sticks or stones. Perhaps the trees of the neighboring forest would supply them with eatable fruit. Lastly, the sweet water was there. It was accordingly settled that for a few days they would remain at the chimneys, so as to prepare themselves for an expedition, either along the shore or into the interior of the country. This plan suited Neb particularly. As obstinate in his ideas as in his presentiments, he was in no haste to abandon this part of the coast, the scene of the catastrophe. He did not, he would not believe in the loss of Cyrus Harding. No, it did not seem to him possible that such a man had ended in this vulgar fashion, carried away by a wave, drowned in the floods a few hundred feet from a shore. As long as the waves had not cast up the body of the engineer, as long as he, Neb, had not seen with his eyes, touched with his hands, the corpse of his master, he would not believe in his death. And this idea rooted itself deeper than ever in his determined heart. An illusion, perhaps, but still an illusion to be respected, and one which the sailor did not wish to destroy. As for him, he hoped no longer, but there was no use in arguing with Neb. He was like the dog who will not leave the place where his master is buried, and his grief was such that most probably he would not survive him. This same morning, the 26th of March, at daybreak, Neb had set out on the shore in a northerly direction, and he had returned to the spot where the sea, no doubt, had closed over the unfortunate Harding. That day's breakfast was composed solely of pigeons' eggs and lithodomes. 
Herbert had found some salt deposited by evaporation in the hollows of the rocks, and this mineral was very welcome. The repast ended. Pencroft asked the reporter if he wished to accompany Herbert and himself to the forest, where they were going to try to hunt. But on consideration it was thought necessary that someone should remain to keep in the fire, and to be at hand in the highly improbable event of Neb requiring aid. The reporter accordingly remained behind. "'To the chase, Herbert,' said the sailor. "'We shall find ammunition on our way, and cut our weapons in the forest.' But at the moment of starting Herbert observed that since they had no tinder it would perhaps be prudent to replace it by another substance. "'A what?' asked Pencroft. "'Burnt linen,' replied the boy. "'That could, in case of need, serve for tinder.' The sailor thought it very sensible advice. Only it had the inconvenience of necessitating the sacrifice of a piece of handkerchief. Notwithstanding, the thing was well worth trying, and a part of Pencroft's large checked handkerchief was soon reduced to the state of a half-burnt rag. This inflammable material was placed in the central chamber at the bottom of a little cavity in the rock, sheltered from all wind and damp. It was nine o'clock in the morning. The weather was threatening, and the breeze blew from the southeast. Herbert and Pencroft turned the angle of the chimneys, not without having cast a look at the smoke which, just at that place, curled round a point of rock. They ascended the left bank of the river. Arrived at the forest, Pencroft broke from the first tree two stout branches which he transformed into clubs the ends of which Herbert rubbed smooth on a rock. Oh, what would they have not have given for a knife? The two hunters now advanced among the long grass, following the bank. From the turning which directed its course to the southwest, the river narrowed gradually, and the channel lay between high banks, over which the trees formed a double arch. Pencroft, lest they should lose themselves, resolved to follow the course of the stream, which would always lead them back to the point from which they started. But the bank was not without some obstacles. Here the flexible branches of the tree bent level with the current, there creepers and thorns which they had to break down with their sticks. Herbert often glided among the broken stumps with the agility of a young cat, and disappeared in the underwood but Pencroft called him back directly, begging him not to wander away. Meanwhile the sailor attentively observed the disposition and nature of the surrounding country. On the left bank the ground, which was flat and marshy, rose imperceptibly towards the interior. It looked there like a network of liquid threads which doubtless reached the river by some underground drain. Sometimes a stream ran through the underwood, which they crossed without difficulty. The opposite shore appeared to be more uneven, and the valley of which the river occupied the bottom was more clearly visible. The hill, covered with trees disposed in terraces, intercepted the view. On the right bank walking would have been difficult, for the declivities fell suddenly and the trees bending over the water were only sustained by the strength of their roots. It is needless to add that this forest, as well as the coast already surveyed, was destitute of any sign of human life. Pencroft only saw traces of quadrupeds, fresh footprints of animals, of which he could not recognize the species. In all probability, and such was also Herbert's opinion, some had been left by formidable wild beasts, which doubtless would give them some trouble. But nowhere did they observe the mark of an axe on the trees, nor the ashes of a fire, nor the impression of a human foot. On this they might perhaps congratulate themselves, for on any land in the middle of the Pacific the presence of man was perhaps more to be feared than desired. Herbert and Pencroft speaking little, for the difficulties of the way were great, 
advanced very slowly, and after walking for an hour they had scarcely gone more than a mile. As yet the hunt had not been successful. However, some birds sang and fluttered in the foliage, and appeared very timid, as if man had inspired them with an instinctive fear. Among others, Herbert descried, in a marshy part of the forest, a bird with a long, pointed beak, closely resembling the kingfisher, but its plumage was not fine, although of a metallic brilliancy. "'That must be a jacamar," said Herbert, trying to get nearer. "'This will be a good opportunity to taste, Jacamar,' replied the sailor, "'if that fellow is in a humour to be roasted.' Just then a stone cleverly thrown by the boy struck the creature on the wing, but the blow did not disable it, and the Jacamar ran off and disappeared in an instant. "'How clumsy I am!' cried Herbert. "'No, no, my boy,' replied the sailor. "'The blow was well aimed.' Many a one would have missed it altogether. Come, don't be vexed with yourself. We shall catch it another day. As the hunters advanced, the trees were found to be more scattered, many being magnificent, but none bore eatable fruit. Pencroft searched in vain for some of those precious palm trees which are employed in so many ways in domestic life and which have been found as far as the fortieth parallel in the northern hemisphere, and to the thirty-fifth only in the southern hemisphere. But this forest was only composed of coniferae, such as Diodorus, already recognized by Herbert. The Douglas pine, similar to those which grow in the northwest coast of America, and splendid firs, measuring a hundred and fifty feet in height. At this moment a flock of birds, of a small size and pretty plumage, with long glancing tails, dispersed themselves among the branches strewing their feathers, which covered the ground as with fine down. Herbert picked up a few of these feathers, and after having examined them, "'These are curacus," said he. "'I should prefer a moorcock or guinea-fowl,' replied Pencroft. Still, if they are good to eat, they are good to eat, and also their flesh is very delicate, replied Herbert. Besides, if I don't mistake, it is easy to approach and kill them with a stick. The sailor and the lad, creeping among the grass, arrived at the foot of a tree, whose lower branches were covered with little birds. The curacus were waiting the passage of insects, which served for their nourishment. Their feathery feet could be seen clasping the slender twigs which supported them. The hunters then rose, and using their sticks like scythes, they mowed down whole rows of these curacus, who never thought of flying away, and stupidly allowed themselves to be knocked off. A hundred were already heaped on the ground before the others made up their minds to fly. "'Well,' said Pencroft, here is game which is quite within the reach of hunters like us we have only to put out our hands and take it the sailor having strung the curacus like larks on flexible twigs they then continued their exploration the stream here made a bend towards the south but this detour was probably not prolonged for the river must have its source in the mountain and be supplied by the melting of the snow which covered the sides of the central cone. The particular object of their expedition was, as has been said, to procure the greatest possible quantity of game for the inhabitants of the chimneys. It must be acknowledged that, as yet, this object had not been obtained. So the sailor actively pursued his researches, though he exclaimed when some animal which he had not even time to recognize fled into the long grass, if only we had the dog Top. But Top had disappeared at the same time as his master, and had probably perished with him. Towards three o'clock new flocks of birds were seen through certain trees, at whose aromatic berries they were pecking, those of the juniper-tree among others. 
Suddenly a loud trumpet call resounded through the forest. This strange and sonorous cry was produced by a game bird called grouse in the United States. They soon saw several couples, whose plumage was rich chestnut brown mottled with dark brown, and tail of the same color. Herbert recognized the males by the two wing-like appendages raised on the neck. Pencroft determined to get hold of at least one of these Gelanaceae, which were as large as a fowl, and whose flesh is better than that of a pullet. But it was difficult, for they would not allow themselves to be approached. After several fruitless attempts, which resulted in nothing but scaring the grouse, the sailor said to the lad, "'Decidedly, since we can't kill them on the wing, we must try to take them with a line.' "'Like a fish?' cried Herbert, much surprised at the proposal. "'Like a fish,' replied the sailor quite seriously. Pencroft had found among the grass half a dozen grouse nests, each having three or four eggs. He took great care not to touch these nests, to which their proprietors would not fail to return. It was around these that he meant to stretch his lines, not snares, but real fishing lines. He took Herbert to some distance from the nests, and there prepared his singular apparatus with all the care which a disciple of Isaac Walton would have used. Herbert watched the work with great interest, though rather doubting its success. The lines were made of fine creepers, fastened one to the other of the length of fifteen or twenty feet. Thick, strong thorns, the points bent back, which were supplied by a dwarf acacia bush, were fastened to the ends of the creepers by way of hooks. Large red worms, which were crawling on the ground, furnished bait. This done, Pencroft, passing among the grass and concealing himself skillfully, placed the end of his lines armed with hooks near the grouse nests. Then he returned, took the other ends, and hid with Herbert behind a large tree. There they both waited patiently, though it must be said that Herbert did not reckon much on the success of the inventive Pencroft. A whole half-hour passed, but then, as the sailor had surmised, several couple of grouse returned to their nests. They walked along, pecking the ground, and not suspecting in any way the presence of the hunters, who, besides, having taken care to place themselves to leeward of the Galanaceae. The lad felt at this moment highly interested. He held his breath, and Pencroft, his eyes staring, his mouth open, his lips advanced, as if about to taste a piece of grouse, scarcely breathed. Meanwhile, the birds walked about the hooks, without taking any notice of them. Pencroft then gave little tugs which moved the bait as if the worms had been still alive. The sailor undoubtedly felt much greater anxiety than does the fisherman, for he does not see his prey coming through the water. The jerks attracted the attention of the Galanaceae, and they attacked the hooks with their beaks. Three voracious grouse swallowed at the same moment bait and hook. Suddenly, with a smart jerk, Pencroft struck his line, and a flapping of wings showed that the birds were taken. Hurrah! he cried, rushing towards the game, of which he made himself master in an instant. Herbert clapped his hands. It was the first time that he had ever seen birds taken with a line but the sailor modestly confessed that it was not his first attempt, and that besides he could not claim the merit of invention. "'And at any rate,' added he, "'situated as we are, we must hope to hit upon many other contrivances.' The grouse were fastened by their claws, and Pencroft, delighted at not having to appear before their companions with empty hands, and observing that the day had begun to decline, judged it best to return to their dwelling. The direction was indicated by the river, whose course they had only to follow, and, towards six o'clock, tired enough with their excursion, Herbert and Pencroft arrived at the chimneys. 
End of chapter.